Good morning. Good Lord. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning on a sunny Sunday morning. Uh, we're going to open the service with any prayer requests or any testimonies anybody might have this morning. Anybody want to share anything? Yeah. Thursday for a week, so Yeah, praise the Lord. Enjoy. Yeah, we're going sure. Uh, so first of all, I'm grateful for this church, for its members, my brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm grateful for God's love and how it transforms us and makes us better people. I'm also grateful that the construction of my new home uh, it's it's going right now, so that's very exciting. Um, there's been many things. I'm also grateful for the job that I have. Uh, I had my year evaluation, uh, not this past week, but the week before. And then this past week, we talked about uh, salary and, and all this stuff, and pretty much. All the numbers that my manager submitted for me were approved. So uh, I got a bonus for the first time. I've been working at something that was exciting. Uh, my pay raise was uh, very significant. I've never seen that much uh, being given to anyone. So that's, that's exciting and encouraging. Uh, other than that, just a uh, prayer for for my family that we continue to, to be blessed the way that we have been and, and, and God's grace continue to fall on us. But also for, uh, there's a other couple of things. So Lawrence, my brother, right now is having this feud with one of our cousins. And, uh, you know, it has to do with, uh, with money. And he made a comment a few weeks ago on Facebook. And I said, well, let me tell you why you shouldn't do that. And I gave him the scripture in Proverbs that says, the, the borrower is slow to blunder. It talks about uh, that, and, and you know, we talked about that in financial peace. And I told him, you never, never have a financial deal with the world. And his relationship is going to change after that. Uh, so, prayer for his heart to, to change and go in the direction that the Lord wants him to go, whether it's to let it go, or if he wants to continue to pursue it, he does it in a, in a different manner. It doesn't continue to erode that relationship. Um, the other thing is, Kelly and I have been thinking about um, bringing my mom over to stay with us for a bit after the new house is done. But with all the uh, logistics involving my aunt's care. Uh, we're still trying to figure that out. So, prayer for for wisdom and for the Lord to put in the key persons involved in this whole thing. It's hard. Uh, what it is that we're all supposed to do, so that hopefully it uh, materializes. Because my mom deserves a break. She's retired, but she's not retired because she's not teaching kids anymore. She's now full time. Caregiver of a sick person, while being a sick person. So, hopefully, uh, that whole thing will get resolved. Anyone else this morning? Yeah. <clears throat> we had something happen. Well, Jane had a young man, I guess. <laughs> I told her this morning, uh, I don't know. I haven't felt well for the last couple of days, and today I started feeling I went to bed at 7.30 and got up at 6.30, so that is unbelievable. But I feel better today, but anyhow, my brother that has having the kidney problems, he is just not getting any relief. And of course the family's talking about, well, we need to pray harder and all, and I said, no, you know, we need to believe harder. Yeah. It isn't praying harder, the doctor. Right. We just need to believe that, you know, here's the thing. It's not, if, we, if we're if we not careful, we see with our eyes and we begin to doubt. 
but we have to see with our hearts and yes. faith and says we ask this Jesus is his word is true yes. and so I told Jane I said you know what we need and we need a miracle and she said wait a minute let me show you something now, if I don't if I don't mess this up this absolutely thrilled me it's from my granddaughter Gabby and she posted this yesterday I guess and said I'm torn with being the person who posts this entire, their entire life on social media and posting what brings me joy. But I've recently been told by someone that they admire how much I know what I believe and in how to, no matter what, I stick to it. I was, of course, very flattered because when you're going through tough times, it's hard to seem like you got anything together. But over the past week, I've been continually shown over and over how truly real and almighty powerful God is. Mom. My mom keeps telling me, let God lead your path. And he has never been more alive to me than he is right now. My impatient, very controlling self has always struggled with waiting on God's timing. But I can feel him working on me, helping me grow, helping me realize I can do and have it all with him. He has every single day shown me why I need to cast everything on, uh, cast everything I have on him. How through him will I get through the struggle and how joy is coming my way. He is telling me, follow me. I will not let you down. It's funny in the way he appears in our lives, but wow, am I ever so thankful that he does. No matter what, I believe he's got me. So Lord, lead me and direct my path. I'm yours. Now, I read that and I told Jane, and I said, that is the fruit that God promises us Yes. When we raise up a child in the way she, yes. they should go, yes. we, you know, we taught her mom, her uncle, aunt, and they've taught their kids. And when you think 20-year-olds going to college, they're going to get into all kinds of things. Mm. But I, I have no fear. Yes. Fear not. Be not afraid or dismayed. Right. God is in control yes. of yes. everything. everything. And if ever we need to encourage one another yes. and say, don't look at, you know, with your eyes. Right. Because the world is in a total mess. Yes. But I tell you what, God is more than yes. able and in yes. control. Amen. Amen. And uh, that, that just thrilled me. Yes. Made my day. Yes. That's one of the most exciting things about working with the kids downstairs is get to just plant those little seeds. Yeah. You know, the parents do the hard work. Us as Sunday school teachers, we get them maybe once a week, once a month, depending on how much we're downstairs. But it's such a joy to plant those seeds and to see them blossom in those children and how God is just so wonderful in how he deals with those children and how, how he pours out their wis his wisdom to them. Yes. Yes. It blows my mind. Like some of the things these kids say, and I'm like, whew. Yeah. That's just God wisdom, yeah. divine yeah. wisdom, and they're just little sponges. So yeah. it's just such a blessing to watch all of our youngsters blossom and grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, front. To thank God for the Iowa Center passed the abortion bill, yeah. restricting abortions after.
and I uh, started to clench my teeth while I was sleeping, which then gave me a stress migraine, and I was in bed for two days. So yesterday, was, I, I was in bed most of the day, and then last night, um, I put my headphones on, and um, I was listening to some stuff on YouTube, and then God just took right on over. So I know Tammy's already read this, but I... I know this is for me, but um, I feel like God wants me to read this because there's somebody else in there who needs to hear this. So um, I'm just going to read it real quick. Okay. I am no longer a slave to fear. Why? I know who I am and whose I am. Every day, there are people who are going to hell. People who will never know the love of Jesus. So if you believe that you are a Christian, it's time to stand up, rise up. Don't you bow to the devil, don't you listen to the lies. You go out there today and you share Jesus. Jesus wants to see this nation come to him. He wants to use you. So if you just came to celebrate Jesus and you do nothing with it outside these walls, then what is it really? Let us be a witness today. What are you going to do with the life that he gave you? If you love Jesus and you are really a Christian, then share it with someone today. All of you have a specific purpose, to manifest sonship. Out of sonship, you destroy the devil everywhere you go. Glorify Jesus. We need to burn with his fire. Send me, I'll go. Take away the excuses. Live out your faith. Be a disciple. A disciple is one that loves like Jesus loves. God loved the world that he gave. We need to be givers like God. Our lives should be a drink offering, poured out by God every day. We don't need for someone to pray for you to be filled back up. You need to understand that the connection we have is with the fountain itself, which is Him. Radical, profuse, everlasting love. Learn from Jesus. Seek first the kingdom, which is right standing with God. Seek soul prosperity. We are called to do the very thing He's put in front of us, nothing more and nothing less. The world is changed by those who don't accept it. God is ready to do a new thing in your life. Are you ready to let go of the old things? Experience is not what happens to you. It is what you do with that what happens to you. Don't waste your pain. Use it to help others. We are products of our past, but we don't have to be prisoners of it. Right? We can't always see where the road leads, but God promises there's something better up ahead. We just have to trust him because you haven't seen your best days yet. Amen. Amen. Well, I really needed that because uh, God and I have this relationship where he doesn't yell at me, but he yells at me. And... Um, then I respond with kind of yelling back sometimes, and then having to say, yeah, you're right, this is what I should be doing, and, you know, really just deep, dig deeper into him, you know, and I've decided that, you know, I feel like we forget what his promises are, what he promised us, and and we need to remind ourselves of that every single day, yeah. what his promises are to us, because he doesn't lie. Yeah. You know, he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That is so nice to know that there's one thing in my life that will never change. It's constant. It never changes. No matter what my day or what other people right. throw at me, yeah. it doesn't matter. Right. It does not matter because what he said isn't going to change. Right. And when I take my my eyes off of me, and I can put my eyes on those in front of me, that's that's where that's where everything starts to flow out. And it was just when we were practicing.
practicing this morning, it's all about the river. It's all about the river. We are the river. You know, we have that. Why, why are we building dams? Why are we stopping the river? Why are we doing that? Why? Why? Because our job here is, is to love and to, to spread Jesus' love. Without even saying, I'm a Christian or wearing whatever. We should never have to do that because the way that we act and the way that we treat people should tell people instantaneously that we are children of God. You know, and I said to Suzanne a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, if I'm a new creation, why am I not acting like one? What, what is wrong? Why do I not see that I am not that person? I am not that person anymore. I am redeemed and I am clean. My slate is wiped totally clean. Every day, God gives me grace, but I have to have that faith to believe in his promises. Yes. Yes. Lord, 
the heart situation. Pray for total healing, Lord, that when the doctors look, there's nothing there. You remember Doak, who's dealing with his infirmities, Lord. We speak against all spirit of infirmity, all spirit of disease. Jesus. We pray for Roberto's brother, Lord. His family, Lord, his mother, and his aunt, Lord. That you know the answer to all these situations, Lord. You know the key that unlocks the door, Lord. And as we gather here this morning, Lord, as we come into your house, this house of prayer, Lord, as we gather together to encourage one another, Lord, to worship you and lift up your name, Lord. So we gather to listen to your word, Lord, to receive the word, to renew our minds, Lord, to be reminded of who we are and who you are and who you have created us to be. Let us go forth out of this house this morning, transformed and ready to transform the world around us. Let us seek the opportunities to be salt and light. Let us be aware of those around us who need words of hope, who need words of love, who need words of freedom. And help us, Lord, to be unbound, to stay unbound. Jesus, let your life, the resurrection life, flow through us, so flow through our minds, flow through our hearts, and right out our mouth into the world around us, Lord. Resurrection life that knows no bounds. Jesus. Jesus. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Be with us this morning, Lord. Just a reminder if you brought a cell phone to turn it off till the end of the service. Uh, we are still looking for some help uh, in the sound booth. For uh, someone to run the soundboard, please see Michael if you're interested. And Friday, March 9th, Eastern Gate House of Prayer. Um, Chris, again, um, there's kingdom stuff that's going on. We know that there's going to be a kingdom business uh, a gathering on Saturday. Uh, on the slide, so I didn't see it. Uh, but anyway, focusing on Friday night, that really makes life Sheila. Lord showed me this last Monday morning. I posted on Facebook with uh, a cheesy video I put together, um, basically talking about um, we'll, we have sung and we will be singing even this morning. Uh, chains, breaking chains, unlocking, 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 unlocking. Um, through the last uh, few thousand years, a couple thousand years, there's been a lot of listening uh, and chains. But the Lord reminded me that same key will bind things. The church hasn't been binding things. It hasn't been locking things up. What it has unlocked, unfortunately, is religion and tradition. Everything has been flooding through uh, the body of Christ rapidly, uh, continually, and even on an increase in the last uh, 2,000 years, especially in the last 100, 150 years. It's, it's increased so much because of the technology and stuff that's going on just spreading things that are not of the Lord. So, I know judgment begins in the house of the Lord. I've heard it thousands of times and since I gave my heart to the Lord, really, back in 83. Um, the judgment is for the bride to clear these things up, to take care of these things. And when pastors preaching on the grace message, the truth, the truth, the truth, uh, reflecting things that were back in the first church, um, we need to take those keys that are unlocking and setting people free. These are the same keys that we can take that religion. We can take those traditions. It's time to lock them back up. It's time to put them away. It's time to get them out of our sight. It's time to get them out of our heart and mind. So this Friday night, um, we're getting the keys out. We're going to start loosening things that need to be loosed. We're going to start putting away things that need to be put away. All right, well, let's take an offering this morning. Toby and Don, you guys want to come take an offering this morning? <coughs> Toby, you want to ask the blessing, please? Lord, we thank you for being here today, God. You share your glory, Lord God. You are so worthy of all things, Lord. We just 
strengthen us, God, that we go out and reflect you to this world. Yes. You've been so good to us, God. Sometimes it seems like we're nothing. And we look back at our life and see what you have taken us to, yes. Lord God. But we just expect that you will honor your word as you yes. glorify and say that you would, Lord. We know that each and every day, God, you catch us and move us. We're like a pond in your name, Lord God. You've got us in the right place at the right time. No one can be that perfect but you, Lord God. And there's people out there that you put in front of us each and every day, God, that we can touch. Because yes. you are glorious, God, and use us as your people. Yes. Now, Lord, we just ask that you'll bless this offering, God. Bless the gift of the giver in the mighty name of Jesus. I worship with our special kids. Worship in your name. Go forward, Mary. We're putting on the spot. All right. Uh, keep you soon. Uh, when I was putting this song together, uh, I had a moment this morning, uh, with a teaching moment from the Holy Spirit about discernment. Because the first song that we're going to play has the same, just in the same key as another song that we play. And I kept thinking about that one without keeping up with it. And I'm trying to play the courses we're rehearsing. Now oh, that's not it. I can't consolidate what, is, what I have here with what I'm hearing in my, in my spirit. So it was, it was very nice to. Uh, you know, see a spiritual connection between the things that we're doing and how these songs connect to each other, uh, even if you cannot see it immediately. Uh, and as you put it, you know, the river was connected. So, it was very nice.
Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you, Jesus, for the testimonies that encourage us, Lord. Your faithfulness, that your word is true and never changing. And Lord, when we put our trust in your word, we're putting our trust in you. You and the word are one and the same, never changing. Always right now. And Lord, we thank you for the witnesses that we have to encourage one another, Lord. To know that your word will come to pass. Just as a seed sown will produce. Even though we don't see it, it's underground, it's invisible, and yet the day will come when it sprouts up and becomes a full bloom, a revelation of your goodness and your faithfulness. Thank you, Jesus, that we and our house shall be saved. Hallelujah. Even when we have not been faithful, Lord, you continue to be faithful, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We just love you this morning, Lord, and are so grateful for your continued faithfulness, for never leaving us or forsaking us. For though the, the day may seem dark and fearful, we know that you are the light, and that light shines in a dark place and reveals the glory of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Amen, amen. God bless you all. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Thank you for your uh, sharing your prayer requests and your testimonies. They're a blessing. And I want to thank Mike and the worship team. Roberto. Where'd you go? There you go. Praise the Lord. And uh, also Jody and Suzanne and uh, Tim all did a great job while I was gone. And all of you all did really good, praise the Lord. I'm, I'm glad that it's all good. Whether I'm here or not, it's all good in Jesus' name. Amen. You all do great. I, got the, I had the uh, opportunity this time to be able to hear all three of the messages, and they were superb. They really were. You all did really, really good. And uh, so we were blessed by all of them and uh, appreciate it very much. Praise God. So God is good. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. Sally knows this is coming, so just, <laughs> I'll, I'll take care of my, uh, my denials later, but. How many of y'all got a neighbor that you just that just irritates the crap out of you? Oh well good, I'm the only one. Pray for me. Pray for me. Well I've got a neighbor that every night he comes home, he brings his wife flowers. It's not flowers, it's candy. It's not candy, it's a present of some kind. I mean every night he's coming home and bringing his wife some kind of a gift or something. So Sally said to me, she said, why don't you do that? And I said, I don't even know the woman. <laughs> remember that? <laughs> yeah, remember that book a few years back, you know, women are from Venus, men are from Mars or something. You know, I mean, that's just it. You know, that's, our minds just don't always jive exactly the, the way you might think, praise the Lord. So. Anyway, I appreciate y'all uh, dealing with everything while I was gone and I had a good time being just being off. We didn't really go anywhere. The weather was lousy, but that was all right. We didn't have any place we had to be other than Prairie City every day to pick up grandkids, but it's all good. Thank the Lord. And I was thinking, uh, someone mentioned this to me the other day about being frustrated about church growth, and believe me, I'm not. Sally will tell you, I don't. I never even talk about it. It's not something that ever really even comes up. Obviously, we want to have as big an impact and you know influence on the 
the community as we can. But in terms of numbers, I quit worrying about that a long time ago. And partly because I have a, a really good friend that's been a limo driver for 25 years. And he's never had a customer. <laughs> Imagine all that time and nothing to show for it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you. <laughs> I'll bet. Well, <laughs> he's back. Praise the Lord. All right, enough of that, but let's move on. Praise the Lord. I do, I, I do appreciate the testimonies. And <clears throat> so Sally had mentioned last night, it was after we, we hadn't gone to bed about 10 o'clock. And <clears throat> we had a, in fact, we had a, a get together, a couple of my uh, daughters and their family, and, and uh, had a Greek dinner. And it was really good. It was a lot of fun. And uh, they all made different things and stuff. So it was all, it was all really good. And uh, after they left, and we took care of the, you know, clean up and so forth. Uh, we were laying in bed. Sally said, "Did you, Mike had Mike had posted something?" She said, and I, and she said, "You might want to, might be interested in seeing it." Which I never get on Facebook. I never, unless she tells me something about it. I don't know what's happening there. <clears throat> so I said, "Sure, I'll take a look at it." And and he was talking about basically what he mentioned here this morning. I don't know how many of you saw the post, but anyway, it was that kind of thing. So. And I told her then, I said, this is weird because, I mean, I'm, it's not exactly what, what he's talking about, but yet it really is how, what the Lord was dealing with me about for the message. And so, and I already had everything laid out for my message, although I'm constantly going back. And if you can see my notes, you'll see they're all scribbled out and then there's something else written in. But, but uh, that's always the case. That just happens all the time. But it was just really interesting. And then to hear the things that were said this morning again, it just amazes me how God you know, just validates and, you know, witnesses to, to his spirit and how that we all have that same spirit. So it's not surprising that we kind of jive with the things that are going on in our, our minds and in our lives. So with that said, let's, uh, of course, my way of getting there will be pretty <laughs> obtuse, <laughs> obscure, weird, because that's just the way it works for me. I, I kind of go all over everything in the way I try to get to the end. But nevertheless, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want to read verses 12 through 16, Sheila. And I do have quite a few scriptures this morning, so be prepared. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So God's plan from Genesis to Revelation is simply redemption. And, of course, that you have to have this revelation of Jesus Christ in order to have any comprehension of redemption. He is our Redeemer. Amen. So from God's perspective, there have only been two men in the earth. Now, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a personal relationship with each one of us, but the truth is, and you look through the Scripture, it's the first Adam, first man, Adam, second man, Jesus, the second Adam. Amen. The last Adam, in fact. Praise the Lord. So... The first was of the earth, the scripture says. He was earthy. God created him, you know, by the, by the earth, of the earth. I mean, he made this form. He formed him out of the dust of the ground. But he breathed the breath of life into him. He breathed God life into him, the spirit that made him a living being, not just a flesh and, and, and bone, you know. So he forms him of the dust of the ground and so forth. And then the second man... The second Adam was the Lord from heaven, the exact image, exact representation of God. Now, even though he was a man in terms of his birth, he was born of God. So he didn't have the, the, the DNA of a human being. He had the DNA of God, right? right? He was fully man, yeah. 
He operated strictly as a man, but he didn't have the earth corruption of Adam. Are you with me? He had to have that or else he could not have redeemed us. Somebody had to come in that wasn't already, uh, you know, tainted, if you will, by man, by the natural fallen nature. Amen. So we have, the scripture says, we have borne the image of the earthy and we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We were all born in sin. Amen. But if we're born again, we're born from above. So we have that same thing that we're talking about here. We had the first Adam. Then we get born again. We have the second Adam. So after the first Adam fell, he fell from the image of God. He was still alive. He still had a body. He still had that thing that God had formed. He just didn't have the connection spiritually any longer. Amen. So God's plan for redemption began right then. It was to bring us back to this oneness with God. This image of God in human form. Amen. He came to restore us not only to God's likeness but to innocence and to a no sin consciousness. Which is what Adam had initially. He was innocent. It wasn't that he didn't do stuff that by the law might have been considered sin. It's just that there was no law. He had no knowledge of good or evil. So he was just innocent. He was like a baby in, the, in those terms. So God wants to reveal himself in and through a people. It's always been this way. Amen. To be in and to be one with a people not just for the sake of having a place to abide, because he could live, he could be anywhere at any time, but to be in a people who will manifest his life, who will manifest his nature, right. who will manifest his very being. Right. Yes. Amen. Now that's not keeping the law, right. because as far as God's concerned and we're concerned, there is no law. Right. We are back to innocence. If we've been redeemed, we are back one with God, yes. without any should have no sin consciousness, or in other words, we shouldn't be thinking in terms of good or evil. We should just be thinking of our relationship with God and walk that out. That's kind of what, what, uh, what I got from what Sarah was saying, too, is this, that we, look, you can't do this by trying to be spiritual. Because then you come off as being phony, and people who, they, they get it. I mean, they understand that. If, you, that God, if God wanted us to all be that, then when we got born again, we would have all lost our personality. We would have lost everything that identifies us as being who we are. And I'm not talking about sin. I'm just talking about every one of us have a different personality. Right. And there's a reason for that. Right. Because that's how we reach other people. Yes. By being real. Yes. By being natural. And I, I'm not going to get too deep into this. I don't want to seem like I'm being critical. But in a way, I guess I am. But you know, when I over the last ten years or more, when I've read the Bible, I'm looking. When I read the Bible, I'm looking to see what was Jesus doing, what was his disciples doing, what were his apostles doing, and this goes to what Mike was saying, and my the way I understand it anyway. We do a lot of stuff they didn't do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we we just do, and I want to know why are we doing it. If that's our prototype, if that's the way we're supposed to be, then why are we doing all this other stuff that has nothing to do with what he was doing? And if we're doing all this other stuff, maybe that's why we're not having the influence and not seeing the Spirit move in our lives the way it should, because we're putting stuff between us, who we really are in Christ, and the personality that God gave us through our families, through our relationships and everything else, to be that dispenser, amen, of God's Spirit in this earth. Amen. You know, the first thing that religion tries to do is, is just destroy your personality. Try to make you a clone, to make you like everybody else so we're all in lockstep. And at that point, you've lost your, your ability to influence. Yes. Now the only people who want anything to do with you are the people that are doing the same thing. Yes. Right? So, amen. Galatians 1 uh, verses 13 through 16. This is, like I said, this is a long and a kind of a roundabout way of doing this, but I hope you all just stay with me because I'll bet you, <coughs> excuse me, that every one of you have this, 
have these same thoughts, have these same feelings. Maybe you express them in a different way or, you know, the way they, you relate to them just because we are different. But I'm, I promise you, we all have these questions like, what in the world, why doesn't that happen? Why isn't this working? Why is this the way it is, right? Well, we've got something to do about that because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changing, so it has to be some way that we are dispensing this God or revealing this God in the earth that's screwing things up or not allowing Him to be revealed. Praise the Lord. So you have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Now, let me just say this. We always look at this when Paul talks about his, you know, traditional church and all that stuff. Okay, it's fine to look at that and say, well, yeah, Paul, what a jerk. You know, you, you were this Pharisee of Pharisees and, you know, all the rules and everything you followed. We do the same thing. We're just not in the Jewish church of the first century. Amen. So we have a tendency to want to push everything off in history or off to the future rather than realizing that God left this in there. It's something for us. It isn't just to give us a history lesson about how, you know, pharisaical Paul was. So if you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation. So he was, you know, everybody said, wow, that's a Jew. And I mean, that is a religious guy. That's somebody who really, you know, got it together. Being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son. And this is the important part. What did Paul get called to? The same thing every one of us gets called to. He's not talking about this is what I'm special and so this is what's happening. He's telling us this is what happens for every one of us. We have been called before the foundation of the world. And from our mother's womb, we were called and, and by His grace. Yes. Not by what, anything we've done because when we were called, we hadn't done anything yet. We hadn't even been born yet. Right. So to reveal His Son in us, yes. in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Yes. That's God's purpose for every one of us. It is. It is. Everybody that's born again is born again to reveal Jesus. It's not to perpetuate our denomination, our religious kind of values or any of that. It's to reveal Christ. See, religion tries to dress you up, paint you up, and try to make you work to look the part. Praise the Lord. We're not supposed to pursue religious traditions or a gospel that's after man, Paul said. But we're to be led by the Spirit. That's the only way we can reveal Jesus. Praise the Lord. All right. I'll show you. We, we talked about this just briefly, but let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 44 through 49. 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 44 through 49. Praise God. So it's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there's a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. So in, in other words, he said, so the first thing that came was not spiritual in, in the sense of that's how he lived. He was natural. And after that, which is spiritual. Which is just another way of saying the first man, earthy, second Adam, Christ, heavenly. Right? So the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As, the, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. So the soulish realm is earthy. The spiritual realm is heavenly. It's always going to be that way. always has been that way. Okay? And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we were born into that soul realm. Into the just, like when, when Adam fell, what did God say? You're going to have to do this by the sweat of your brow. You're going to have to figure this out now. You're going to have to make it happen. You're going to have to work to make this thing work, right? Where before you didn't have to do anything except just receive the bounty, you know? 
So as we have borne the image of the earthy, we, also, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Praise the Lord. So we all know about the earthy. We've got a lot of experience and practice and, you know, all that. The problem is identifying with the heavenly, which is who we are now once we've been born again. And our, this part didn't get saved. It has to be renewed. So the soul realm, the, that has to be renewed to agree with our true identity as spirit beings. This is the, because if you don't, you're in the same boat Adam was in. You'll, you'll never get out of it. Yeah. Right? He chose to out, try to outthink the system. Yeah. If I do this, if I do that, I'll have, you know. And all it did was create chaos. Yeah. So everybody's either in the first Adam of the earth, earthy, or the second Adam, heavenly. They're either operating in the soul realm, in the intellectual realm, or they're operating in the spirit realm. This is exactly what Don was talking about. We got to quit seeing with our eyes, with our natural eyes. This is how Jesus dealt with this. Because all you're going to see is negative. All you're going to see is the reason why it can't happen, the reason why it won't work, the reason why you don't have the ability to make it come to pass. That's why we have to get past that. That's why we have to operate from the Spirit. Because the Spirit, amen, it sees. We, we receive things in the Spirit that make absolutely no sense whatsoever to the natural mind, to the, to the soul realm. Amen. And if we'll follow that, yes. we'll get results of the kingdom. Absolutely. The kingdom's in us, right? So what the, what the soul tries to get you to do is, think to, is to focus on it being somewhere else. If I can do this and do that, then I'll get the kingdom. I'll get the, the prayer answered. I'll get the deliverance. I'll get the whatever it is. The Spirit is always telling you you have it. It's already yours. Yes. Amen. By His stripes, you were healed. Yes. You've been delivered. Amen. You have this ability. So, but that you have to renew your mind to the Word or it'll always drag you back to the flesh. It'll always drag you back to the why nots, to the how can it, you know, all those kinds of things, right? So unless there is a revealing of Jesus, now that's the point. As long as we're in our natural mind, no matter how good we are, we're not revealing anything but a better human. And that won't work because we know from experience that better human can be the worst human the next day. Yeah. You know, just based on circumstances, based on our life, based on our interaction with other people and things, right? So nothing, unless there is a revealing of Jesus Christ in us, then no matter how we try to fix ourselves up, no matter how much religious makeup we put on, no matter how spiritual we act, we're never satisfied. And we can never fulfill who we really are. Amen? The whole 60s, and I, I suspect every generation, but just the 60s, it was more verbal about it, was about finding yourself. I mean, the drugs, the thing, everything. But every generation has their thing. they got to try to figure out who they are. This is what Gabby's talking about. She's finding herself. She didn't have to go to a commune somewhere. She didn't have to, you know, get high for six months or, you know, do acid and contemplate her navel for six months to figure out who she is. She, she's finding out. She's, she's having a revelation of her and Christ are one. Yes. Who I am in Christ. Yes. Instead of my independence and my, my, you know, separateness and my specialness as a, just myself, she's, she's learning the great lesson of life. It's in Christ Amen. Amen. that we live and move and have our being. So that's what we're after. That's, and, and the truth is, even as Christians, we're still trying to find ourselves. Because we haven't renewed our minds. Our minds are still our enemy because they're always constantly dragging us back to the soul realm. Which is where we have all the struggles. This is where everything is overwhelming. And it's too much, right? So, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. The reason we have this treasure in, in earthen vessels is so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So, God has deposited a treasure in each one of us as believers. And that treasure is a whole lot more 
then giftings, then anointings, then special ministry. That treasure is himself. That treasure is his life. He is in us, and we are to be dispensers of his life. The life of God. That's how simple it is. Now, I'm going to say some stuff that may step on some people's toes, and I'm not trying to just be controversial or a pain in the butt. But the truth is, a lot of the stuff that we do, I don't know where it comes from. We call it spiritual. It's just a lot of activity. We're supposed to be dispensers of God's life, not our religious traditions, no matter how ancient or how recent. And believe me, there are a lot of religious traditions that just came up within the last hundred years. And we see them all the time, and we think that's something really spiritual, when in fact, it's no different than what Paul was dealing with when God said, I, the reason I've called you is not for those things, but to reveal me. And because we struggle with the revealing of him, it's easier to make it about us. Now, I'm not, against, you know, I'm not against special meetings, but I'm saying a lot of times we just turn special meetings into us. It's just about us. I'm going to feel it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this. Or it's about somebody's ministry that we all then bow down to that, this healer, this deliverer, this prophet, this whatever. I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying that's man's gospel. That is about making it about people instead of about a revealing of Jesus Christ. Now, I've been around this a little while to tell you I've been in a lot of those meetings. And the reason they generally implode is because ultimately it all becomes about some guy or some woman who's leading the, met, the, the service. And they have no more right to take credit for it than some panhandler off the street. Because unless the Spirit draws people, unless it's the Spirit. But the moment that happens and there is a move of God, and believe me, most of the time that move of God came in spite of what was going on in terms of prayer and, you know, all the other stuff. It came because of God's love for the people and seeing a hunger there. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's not our religious traditions. And it doesn't matter if they're ancient Israeli or if they're recent Pentecostal or charismatic or... Whatever. It's not our works. It's our God. It's His kingdom. It's His reality that we're trying to expose. That we're trying to experience and then expose. Romans chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. And I'm not pretending or trying to imply that I have all the answers. I'm just saying, I don't know, maybe it's, it's having had a birthday. <laughs> one that was, you know, really not one I was ever expecting to have, praise the Lord, to be quite honest with you. If I'd have known I was going to live this long, you know the old thing, I would have taken better care of myself. But the truth is, I kind of think like my grandmother, although I've still got about another 15 years before I can really get away with this, but she, she just got to the place where she'd just say anything. God, that just sounds so unlike Grandma, you know. She said, well, when you get to be my age, you can say whatever you want to because you don't care what people respond, how they respond. Well, that's not totally true. But there comes a point where I'm not really trying to impress anybody or, you know, it's just I've been in these things and seen them and experienced them, and a lot of you have done the same thing. And at some point you start saying, wait a minute. You know, there has to be a reality here that we're missing. Yes. I'm not saying we don't feel the presence of God. There aren't times when we get moved by the presence of God, but I'm saying when we start making it all about us, we have missed the whole point of what this is about. So, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. Praise the Lord. 
Now we're to be operating in the spirit and not in the law, not in legalism, but also not in the carnal or the flesh, in the natural way. Exactly. We're supposed to be operating by the spirit. All right. And that can only be done by his grace. It can only be done by us accepting his grace, not trying to earn it, not trying to do anything, because the moment we start trying to earn it, we have moved from this back up to verse five. See, we have to live out our new identity in Christ, who we really are. The righteousness of God. And we do that by finding ourselves in His Word and not in religion. Yes. Yes. Romans 11, verses 2 through 6. God hath not cast away His people which He foreknew, Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Eliah? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. That's a complicated way of just saying that Baal, this Baal worship, was a counterfeit religion. Remember the same Elijah, what he said. All right, you call on your God. See, by this time, Baal worship had infiltrated the, the Jewish church. They had set up altars, and, and we'll even, I'll touch on it here in a little bit. They had mixed it. They had mixed a, a cosmetic, a outward kind of thing with the truth. And that's what Elijah is, is confronting here. He's saying, everybody's got, gone this way now. I don't, there's, I, there's nobody I can find that's doing it like you told us to do it. Everybody's mixed up all kinds of other stuff into this thing now, and it's unidentifiable as a, as a real word from you. And God said, well, just a minute now. I've got a, I've got a remnant. I've got a people who have not bowed their knee to this yet, who, have, who are still trying to find the purity of this truth. Now, I believe that's what happens. I, this is my thing, okay? This is what I believe happens in the last days. I think that's the reason for the message of grace being preached and so many other things that we're hearing preached today that, that a lot of us that were in church years ago, not just because of our denomination, but just simply it wasn't being preached. It just wasn't out there, right? right? So it just, all of a sudden, this is coming back. There's things coming back. And when those things come back, they cause you to start questioning other things because now you're not as fearful to think that, well, maybe we're wrong about that. Maybe that isn't exactly the way God's trying to make it be. And now, because of grace, we don't have to be afraid if we make a mistake about it. Yes. But some people are so stuck in their traditions that they won't move no matter what. Yeah, right. Because they're so afraid, they're so paranoid, and part of that is because they are ignorant of the Scripture. Yeah. They've only let somebody else tell them what it says and, and interpret it for them and then act accordingly. Right. Yes. Praise the Lord. So... Where am I? Did we read 11, 2 through 6? Okay, yes, that's right. Okay, what's important there, if you will, bring it back up, uh, verse 4, I think it is. This has nothing to do with my age. I was quirky when I was 30. Now it's senility, but that's not true. I'm just, just weird as I always was. But what saith the answers of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Now that's, that word Baal, that, that's, a, that's a, like I just talked about briefly, is false worship. It's, it's, a, it's a fake way of approaching God. Right. It's self-centered. Okay? All right. Now, Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 19. I've flipped around on some channels over the last few days. There's one particular, uh, well, there's not one particular, there's several of them, but one in particular that I, was, that I watched that just sickened me. 
was a you know television ministry that's there this is their time to raise money which is almost continuous but nevertheless and it just was so frustrating just you you know I look at it and I think oh my god if you know Christians are actually giving money to this they're believing that if you don't give you're, the next year, I mean, it's a curse that they're trying to put on people. Yes. If you don't do this, that we're telling you that God told us, then you're going to have a horrible next 12 months. Yeah. But if you get it in here and you do it before such and such a time or such and such a date, you're, this year is going to be heaven on earth for you. Just, it just makes you want to slap somebody, you know, for being ignorant. Yeah. This is Jesus walking into the temple and making a whip of and driving out the money changers it's disgusting yes churches and organizations have to have money to survive their 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 businesses in that sense that it takes money to to operate but if you and when you try to manipulate people with god you you best just get out of that and get into something else sell drugs do be honest about it at least instead of trying to I mean, it's, and it's pervasive. There's very few of these that don't do it. And the ones that don't, they stand out, they glare at you. It's like, thank God, it's like a breath of fresh air that they're not in there trying to figure out some way to manipulate people and take advantage of them and use God as their tool. So Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Praise the Lord. Mike's talking about locking and unlocking and loosing and, and binding and so on and so forth. All right, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. Revelation 3 and 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Another way of saying binding and loosing is all this is. Right? He that has the key of David... This is the flow of God's life coming from us. It's about discovering an outward flow of the king's life within us. Amen. Look, all right, look at John chapter 7, 37 to 39. John 7, 37 through 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. We sang a couple of songs about this this morning. This outward flow of God coming from us, the life that's in us, to the people who have the keys to the kingdom. Amen. The ones who have the keys of David. The key of David is the authority of a king. Yes. Yes. See, we complicate a, a lot of this stuff, and it isn't complicated no. if we just read it and believed what it says. Right. Isaiah 22, verses 21 through 25. Isaiah 22, 21 through 25. We're looking for keys. We're wanting to lock. We're wanting to bind. We're wanting to loose. We're wanting to do all these things, right? So he writes, and these are all messianic prophecies that Isaiah is writing, and he says, I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah. This government is the kingdom of God. Amen. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Yes. Binding, loosing. Same thing we talk about in Revelation. I will fasten him as a nail 
in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him, this nail, all the glory of his father's house, the offspring, and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups, even to the vessels of flagons. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail... Now, let me just back up a minute. Remember, we talk about God. The scripture says... We, we are all vessels. Some vessels are gold, some are silver, some are to great honor, some are lesser. That's what he's talking about here. It doesn't mean that you're a vessel of clay. That means you have no value. It just means that you don't have the same identity or the same uh, picture or, or visibility maybe as the gold one. But everybody's the same in the kingdom of God. So he's saying whether in that day the Lord will show the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off for the Lord has spoken it. So here's what he's saying. This is about the person and the work of Jesus. He is the king. He is the key. He is the door. He is the nail fastened in a sure place, cut off from the land of the living. Praise God. When Jesus was cut off and the nail was cut down, he removed the burden of the whole system. So now it's not gold cups, silver cups, brass cups, earthen cups. It's not flagons and it's not little glasses. Everybody has become equal now. We're all righteous in the eyes of God. We have all become vessels of honor, amen, because we are holding a treasure in our vessel, in this earthen vessel. Praise the Lord. Amen. So he removed the burden of the whole system of human works and our labor, our performance, amen, and he became the place where every human labor and work hung. Yes. Yes. It's all hung on him. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right, Isaiah 53 and verse 8. He was taken from prison, from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He wasn't cut off for his iniquity. But he was cut off for the transgression of his people. Yes. Praise the Lord. In other words, he interceded. He took the place. He took the punishment. Yes. All right. Isaiah 53 verse 10. Still talking about locking and unlocking and doors and loosing and binding, right? Finding the keys to the kingdom. Yes. So yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, put, he, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his day, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Mm -hmm. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, and we'll see what we got for this. Mm -hmm. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. According as his divine power, we just read, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How do we get it? Because he was the nail that took everything that we had to do. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Through the knowledge of him, amen, that has called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we become partakers of the divine nature. We become one with God. We get the God life, amen. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world, Amen. Through lust. So the king's life and the king's work and manifestations of power now flow from us. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. But they won't flow from us as long as we're still trying to find them. Yes. If we're still trying to do something to make it happen. Right. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Praise the Lord. Romans 12 and verse 2. Conformable unto his death. Not, it's not talking about me dying now. It's talking about me being conformed to what his death produced. My oneness with him. My new nature. My new creation. Amen. And be not conformed to this world. I want to be conformed to his death, not to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But we know the good and perfect and acceptable will of God is that we be partakers of his divine nature. Yes. 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 
Praise the Lord. So Paul is addressing this whole cosmetic religious system. Praise the Lord. That's what he's dealing with. He's not talking about Judaism in and of itself. He's talking about the whole idea, this whole cosmetic, this whole thing that goes all the way back to Baal worship and, and the infiltration of that into the church. Be not conformed to this world. And that word, and because I ate a Greek dinner last night, I can tell you something about Greek this morning. Praise the Lord. That word translated world in, in the New Testament here where Paul uh, talks about the be not conformed to this world. The one Greek translation is cosmos, which is where we get the word cosmetic. Yeah. Praise the Lord. All right, look at 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 30 through 33. 1 Kings 16, 30 through 33. Now, this is not about women wearing makeup. I've already been there. We've already been there and done that. So, just praise the Lord. Yeah. This is not, that's not what I'm talking about. Praise God. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Now, if you read back, this is genealogies of kings. Mm -hmm. And all of them, I mean, I think Zimri, you go on and on and on back. And, and there's only a handful of them there that dealt with Baal worship, that actually burnt their, you know, their altars and so on and so forth. Most of them just incorporated it. Yeah. And so that's what, now we're here at Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Now, there were some real snakes before him, but he was the worst according to the Scripture. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam and the son of Nebat that he took to wife Jezebel. So it was, it was a light thing. It didn't mean anything to him that he was walking in the same ways that these other kings had that had incorporated Baal worship and everything else. So... So much so that he marries Jezebel, the daughter of Eth Baal, a guy named after this false god, king of the Zidonians, who were Baal worshippers. So he went and served Baal, and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria, and Ahab made a grove. And if you read the law, the Jewish law, they were not to build any other temples except the one in Jerusalem. The others were all to be outside the tabernacle, you know what I'm saying. The others were to be synagogues or, or places of worship strictly and only to God. They couldn't even offer up the sacrifices and things except in Israel. That's why they had the annual feast. Everybody would come to Jerusalem, amen, for these feasts. Well, they were trying to produce that thing outside of the parameters which God had given them. Right. And they include these other demonic things. So he built in Samaria, and Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Praise the Lord. All right, 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30. So he marries this gal, Jezebel. I mean, we've all heard a message about Jezebel. You know, we think it's a woman. It ain't a woman. It's a spirit. Praise the Lord. This happens to be a woman, but she's the physical manifestation of what it is God's dealing with here. So when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she did what? She painted her face and fixed her hair. And she looked out the window. This Ahab's wife, this Baal person who promoted Baal worship and influenced this idiot that was already, you know, off in the never-never land when it comes to his relationship with God. Right. Amen. So it's the paint. Here's what I, the point. It's the paint of Jezebel's face. This cosmetic queen religion right. that we're talking about. That's what is really being spoken of when we talk about Jezebel's spirit, you know, going on. It's been twisted and, you know, distorted into all sorts of stuff, but that's really what we're talking about. It's this, this mask that masks the face of Jesus, that, that hides the reality of what God is really trying to do and who God is and what God's doing. Praise the Lord. Making it look spiritual outside. Yeah. Looks good. Lipstick on a pig, right? <laughs> but it's a facade. Praise the Lord. It's a facade, and that's the difference that Paul is speaking of 
when he talks about being conformed and transformed. All right, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 again, which is where Paul talks about this. Be not conformed to this world or this cosmetic way of living, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what really is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's for us to be a bearer of His existence, of His reality, of His truth. Instead of a religion that's just all about religion and putting on a show and, and makeup and doing the whole thing and, and masking who, who God really is and what He's about. Praise the Lord. And that's this transformed, that word metamorphosis. We've all heard the scriptures of caterpillar, you know. And, and, but the truth is the butterfly was in the caterpillar all the time. Look at Romans 8 and 11. You think about... Praise the Lord. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world. We all think it's, you know, some timeline and it's such and such a date and such and such a time. I made a trip and I did this and I did that. Well, yeah, it, naturally speaking, that may be true, but you were, you were destined. You were in Christ. God knew you how you would respond. I'm not talking Calvinism here. I'm just saying He knew. At some point, you were going to say, in fact, He knew the point, you would say yes to Him. All right, so, but if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. See, the Spirit, the, the butterfly was always in the caterpillar. Just a matter of time before it was quickened or brought to life. And that's what God does with us. I talked about, you know, several years ago, I talked about being hid in the world. Most of us were, because if the devil had known where we were going, he'd have killed. He had plenty of opportunities to kill us. He just didn't think we were going to be a threat. Right. Because we were playing his game. Yep. We were a caterpillar yeah. that just hadn't metamorphosed right. into the butterfly yet. Right. And he couldn't tell. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. It's not something we make happen. No. It's just something we live out. Butterfly can't make itself a butterfly. It just has to go through the process of metamorphosis yes. until the caterpillar sheds its skin and yes. out comes the butterfly. Yes. Praise the Lord. Philippians 3 and 10. See, we, you know, we have a, an advantage. Because we're not locked into a denomination. I don't have to worry about how many presbyters and superintendents that I offend. I've already been down that road and, and offended all of them and had my issues with it. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm not trying to be... I'm just saying, look, there's a reason why we have the freedom that we have. And that's so that we can pursue the truth of God's Word without the barriers and the constrictions and restrictions, amen, that you have otherwise. Because they're stuck. They, they got traditions and they got to have. And we've carried some traditions in here. All of us have. I'm not, I'm not pointing my finger and I'm not being critical or hateful or judgmental. I'm just saying we got baggage. All of us got baggage. Some of it came from other religious things that we were involved in. Some of it came from the world. All of those things are there. That's why we have to renew our mind. But if we're too afraid to let go of some things for something else that God has, you can't get something with a closed fist. You can't get it until you're willing to let loose. That doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater and abandon every revelation we've ever had. It just means that some of that stuff really wasn't revelation at all. It was just human activity that helped to excite people or get people more involved or make them continue to come for an entertainment rather than fellowship and pursuit of God so that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death so that I can be transformed into what his death provided is what he's talking about yes. that I may know him okay so here's the here's the amplified that I may know in that same way to know the power outflowing from His resurrection, which it exerts over believers, and that I may so share His suffering as to be continually transformed in spirit 
into his likeness. That word suffering is really talking about changing. It's about transforming your mind or renewing your mind. Amen. Amen. So into his likeness, even to his death, in the hope of what it accomplished in me. And that's where most of us are not. Not completely. We may have intellectual assent to it. We may understand it intellectually, but we haven't ever actually entered into it. Which is the reason I've been preaching this stuff about the most holy place and all that. It's all talking about the same thing. It's becoming intimate with God, becoming one with God, becoming aware of who we are now. Yes. That we're not trying to get somewhere. We're trying to wake up to where we're at. That we are there. That we have arrived. That it is finished. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's the life. The life that flows from resurrection is God life. That's what we have. Suzanne said, just up here this morning. We have a, What's different about Christianity, what's supposed to be different about Christianity, is that our God came and gave His life, and more importantly for us, He rose again. Yes. And that rising again is what we get the benefit of. Resurrection life, that's God life. Human beings don't rise from the dead. But God life will quicken this mortal body and bring us from that caterpillar, that dead, dormant, that flesh, that carnality into this beautiful reality of who we are in Christ. But if we're not aware of it, except dogmatically, nothing really changes. Praise the Lord. That's King's life. The King of Kings. Who do you say I am? The revelation of Christ contains the keys of the kingdom. It's not another dogma. It's not another creed. It's Jesus. What did Jesus say? Well, Paul or, or Peter said, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. He said, On that rock, on this rock, on this foundation, on that revelation, I'm going to build a church. And you'll get the keys to the kingdom. What are the keys to the kingdom? The revelation of who he is. Isaiah 9, chapter 6, or excuse me. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 10. Some of us know this maybe a little better than others. But it's still Bible. It's still true. Praise the Lord. That's why I'm saying. We're not excluding all revelation that we've gotten. I'm just saying there's more. Because let's face it, we had to embrace a revelation we'd never really grasped before to get the last one we got. We had to let go of some teachings and some traditions, amen, to being able to embrace that one. Well, nothing, God operates the same way. You want more revelation? you got to be willing to hold loosely what you got to get to the next one. Not to discard it, not to, you know, deny it, but don't let it dominate. Let's move to where, where else has he got it? Without that one, we can't get to the, really to the depth of the next one. So for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government, amen, the kingdom will be on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his kingdom, it's going to fill the entire earth. And the peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. Remember the keys that he gave us, the keys of David, the keys of the king. To order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Not us, not people, not religion. God. The Lord sent a word unto Jacob and it hath lightened upon Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, that say in pride and stoutness of heart. This goes back to that Baal worship and all that stuff we were talking about. They say, hey, hey, the bricks are falling down. But we will build with hewn stones. Okay, things aren't quite right, but we'll make it the way we want it. We, we'll do the building. We'll build the next one. We'll, we'll, provi- we'll, we'll, we'll take what we know and, and we'll just build something. Amen. But we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we'll change them into cedars. We'll just make it our way. We'll do it our way. Amen. 
And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, the bricks are falling down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. No, the zeal of the Lord will perform it. Praise God. The gates of hell shall not, cannot prevail against the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not us doing the work, but God's life flowing from us. Jesus said, the kingdom does not come by observation. Praise the Lord. It doesn't come by rituals. It doesn't come by rules. It doesn't come by our special services. It doesn't come from special ministries. If it did, then it would come by observation. I'm not against special service. I'm just saying, we've made them the kingdom. And they're not the kingdom. They're just something we do. Praise the Lord. Luke 17, 20 and 21 is that scripture. He said the, the scribes and these Pharisees are saying, when's the kingdom coming? Show us the kingdom. What? what? 20, uh, Luke 17, 20 and 21. And uh, I mean, think about it. Again, I, I know I sound like I'm picking on everybody and being rude and hateful, but I'm not. I'm just saying, just take it how you want to, I guess. What do we do? Show us a move of God. Show us the kingdom. Get the right preacher. Get the right prophet. Get the right setting. And show us the kingdom. And he said, you're not going to see the kingdom that way. It doesn't come that way. It doesn't come by observation. When he, when he was demanded of the Pharisees, the kingdom of God should come. When's it coming? And he answered them and said, the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. It doesn't come by just viewing something. Neither shall they say, lo here, lo there. For the kingdom of God is in you. Yes. So the very fact that we have special people and yes. special anointings and all of that junk is a denial. It binds up the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is in you. And once I elevate somebody else, I have diminished you so that you won't do it unless so-and-so tells you to do it. Or unless so-and-so is the one doing it. Now the kingdom has been shrunk down to a handful of people who are no more anointed. The only anointing you're, there is is the anointed one, which is Christ in you. You have the same anointing. As long as we're looking to somebody else or some special event or some sight or observation that we can make, then we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is all of us are a revelation or a revealing of God in this earth. All of us lay hands on the sick. Jesus couldn't have made it any plainer when he said, these signs will follow them that believe. Not these signs will follow them that went to seminary. Or these signs will follow them that have a special charisma. These signs will follow everybody that believes. They'll lay hands on the sick. They'll cast out devils. Amen. That's us. But it's easier to do like the children of Israel and say, Oh, look, Moses, you talk to God. And then tell us, because he kind of he freaks us out. But that was also so that later on they could say, Who's this Moses think he is come telling us what to do? They had, they, they had it going both ways. Yeah. Don't have to listen to God because Moses is going to tell us what God said. We don't have to listen to Moses. He's just like us. He's just another guy. Yeah. Well, it's true. It's up to you. Yeah. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Let me ask you, who's the house of the Lord? Yeah. It's not a what. No. It's a who. And the judgment is not condemnation because you've already been judged. The judgment is, are you a revelation of Jesus Christ or are you still mixed up with Baal? Are you still confused here? Amen. The, answer, the easy way to resolve it is the same thing Elijah did. Let God be God and every man a liar. If God is God, He'll take care of this situation. If so-and-so is God, then worship Him. Praise the Lord. The church is built on the power of the living Christ to live His life through us. Not through a handful of people. Not through a pope. Not through a presbyter. Not through a special ministry. Through us. Through His people. Through each and every one of us. 
Let me show you something. John, and we're getting close here. I know I'm running a little long, but <clears throat> I wasn't here last week. Praise the Lord. John 10, uh, verses 1 through 10. Now, I just, I'm going to show you something that is uh, that, that just, I think, kind of exemplifies what I'm talking about. You may disagree with me, and you have every right to. I'm not, uh, you know, I just, I'm just saying what I'm saying here. But he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth in, entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Okay, so anybody that doesn't come through the door is a thief and a robber. He that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they didn't understand what things they were which he spoke unto them. So he spoke the parable till they didn't get it, which is not unusual because they didn't get most of the parables that he spoke. And then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. He's telling them a parable, but he's trying to get them to understand this spiritual reality here. Yeah. I'm the door. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get there through religion. Regardless. But the sheep did not hear them. Those that came before. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, let me ask you something. Anywhere in that ten verses is the devil mentioned? No. We've said it's the devil. Tradition has told us it's the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, it may be true, but that's not in the context of what he's teaching here. John is talking about a door. All right, look again, go back to John 10.1. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Anybody that's, coming, that's not coming through Jesus is a thief and a robber, right? All right, 9 and 10, back to 9 and 10. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he will be saved. He'll go in and out and find pasture. The thief that he talked about in verse 1 comes for nothing but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So the natural uh, result of this just... Thinking it out is that the thief is anything that tries to get you to believe that you can be saved any other way except by Jesus. That's right. yeah. It's not the, I mean, it's demonic, but it's not the devil. Praise the Lord. The thief is the mindset that says there's some other way of entering the kingdom. It's the flesh. It's the unrenewed mind yes. that hasn't seen the complete revelation of Jesus Christ that's looking for some other way yes. to enter. Yes. If I work harder, if I pray more, if I fast longer, if I go to the right meeting, if I get hands laid on by the right person, if I'm in the right circumstance at the right time, in the right situation, and all the stars align, then yeah. there's only one door. That's right. Praise the Lord. Jesus came so that we would have a door, so that we would have an access into the kingdom of God. It's not based on human labor. It's not based on performance. It's based on a door, the door, the door that he is. And the key to that door, to that revelation, to that kingdom is a revelation of Jesus himself. Nothing else. I'm not interested in any other thing because the only way into that paradise, into that kingdom, amen, is through that door. That's right. 
So the key to that door is a revelation of Jesus Christ. A present reigning. Amen? A revelation of Himself. It's based on this whole idea. Is it's based on the door. The door that He is. And the key of who He is. And who we are in Him. It's a present reigning of Jesus Christ in His people. Christ in you, the hope of glory. A treasure in earthen vessels. Ephesians 1, verse 18. A couple more scriptures here. But I, I want you to see what I'm talking about. Ephesians 1, 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling. What the riches... I stand at the door and knock. He's calling, right? So, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what is the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Praise the Lord. All right. All right. Esther, Esther chapter 1, verses 5 through 12. Esther chapter 1, verses 5 through 12. When these days were expired, the king made a feast and all the people. Remember, the, remember I was teaching here a couple weeks ago, whenever it was, about you know, all the excuses everybody made. The, he invites them to the supper, you know, invites them to the feast, and everybody's got, I got this, I got oxen to take care of, I got a wife, I got this, and whatever. So here we got another picture of the same thing. When these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. We know that dinner, that, that supper, was he that comes, he that sups with me, I will, I and my father will come and live in them. Right? So that's the invitation to this dinner is that God wants to be one with us. Amen. Praise the Lord. So he says, in the court of the garden of the king's palace, there were white, green, blue, hangings, fastening with cords. I could go in into all the colors and all this stuff, rings of silver, uh, you know, uh, gold, speaks of redemption and restoration, all these things, but that's not my point here. But upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black and marble, He's just talking about the decorations of this feast. And they gave them drink and vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. Drinking was according to the law. Nobody was compelled to drink, but if they wanted to drink, it was good. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also, Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagatha, and Zethar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen, queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen, Vashti, refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Praise the Lord. All right. Look at Esther chapter 4 now, verses 15 and 16. When Esther bade them return, Mordecai this answer, Go gather this together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast for you for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go into the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. She said, I'm going, but I'm not going by the law. I'm going in expecting mercy and grace. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. All right. Esther 1 again. Verses 15 through 17. Then Esther bade, okay, what shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains. And you could see, I mean, this is the same story that you read in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, where he's inviting these people and they all got excuses and they're all trying to figure out a way out. Uh, she performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains and Mamukin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. King Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. We're not talking about women's rights here. We're not talking about I mean, I know that's what they're saying. Hey, all the women are going to find out she dissed the king 
We can do the same thing to our husbands. That's really not what this is about. What this is about is that, th that people are saying, we don't need that. We can create our own little get-together here. She had her own party going. She didn't need his. Right? She had her bail thing going. I don't need, I'm not worried about this other deal. Ah, oh, the king, the king, the king. I'm the queen. I'll just do what I want to do. Well, if everybody else finds out about it, they won't come to the king either. Everybody else will get into their own little worship thing and their own little way of doing stuff. And, and now we've got a real mess on our hands. Okay, so this deed, the queen shall come abroad. <clears throat> brought him before, but she didn't come, all right? Verse 19. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Look, you could say it's Jews and Gentiles. You could say it's they were offered... It was because of their rejection that we got brought in. There's all sorts of analogies here and metaphors, but enough to say that they reject it, they don't get it, somebody else is going to. Yeah. Praise the Lord. All right. So you got two queens, Vashti and Esther. Uh -huh. Vashti is the cosmetic church. She's the Jezebel. Yes. She's too busy having her own party, right. doing her own thing, just wants... Things her way, the old way, the way that she's done it in the past, her way of doing things, being a queen with a lot of glitz and glamour, but without any substance whatsoever. We have been invited to a throne room to rule and reign with a king. Yeah. Esther 2, verses 15 through 17. We've been invited to a kingdom. We've been given the keys. Keys that no man, or that uh, to a door that no man can lock and no man can open. But once we have come to the king, we bind and it's bound. We loose and it's loosed. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, came, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king, she required nothing. Now get this. She didn't take any of the paint, any of the makeup, any of the stuff to fix herself up. She just came as she was. Come into the king, she required nothing but what Hagar, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken into King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month to Beth. In the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Jesus. Praise the Lord. Yes. Esther said, I'm going to see the king. I'm not going according to the law. No. I'm not going by religion. I'm just going and believing that he'll accept me yes. and that he'll receive me. So we have to let go of our traditions. A lot of those traditions. Religious, Pentecostal, Catholicism, you know, whatever. Okay, we've got to quit thinking that the feast is about us. If we'll enter into the throne room, we'll hear the king. And he'll say, ask of me, and I'll give you the half of my kingdom. You become a joint heir with Jesus Christ. We'll come into union with the king. We know what, what they were speaking of here, but the metaphor is we become one with him. And the result of that is we enjoy the fullness of the kingdom of God as never before. Satisfied fruit will be the natural result. Last scripture and we're done. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Second Peter 1, 10 and 11. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. 
where if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Until that revelation becomes a reality. Yes. Not a teaching, you know, not a doctrine, right. but a part of you. It becomes your reality. Right. That's the kingdom in you. Yes. And the key is a revelation of Jesus Christ yes. and who you are in Him. Yes. Praise the Lord. Don't be afraid to not just continue because it's what we've always known. Because that's the way we have church or that's the way we do this or that's the way we do that. Let's make it about Him. Yes. Let's make the party about Him. Yeah. Yes. He's throwing the feast. Yes. Praise the Lord. And if we make it about Him, we share in all of it. We get to experience every single bit of it. Let's quit elevating people and elevate Jesus and watch what He'll do through you as a result of that. Without this, this thing's going nowhere. It's only going to, we're going to continue on the same treadmill we've been on for 2,000 years. Unlimited access and ability and availability. Whereas what we can do through a revelation of Jesus Christ is unlock that door. Yes. Amen. And the result of that is binding and loosing is now ours. Yes. We find the traditions, we loose the power yes. of the anointing of God in our lives. Yes. People come to God. Amen? Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise <laughs> God. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for your patience. Amen. Go in the power of His might. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. <laughs>